Hey, did you guys have your seats? Are you having a good week at camp? What? Yeah. I tell you, I love camp. I love every single minute of it. We say all the time that camp is the best part of your summer. And I've got a question for you. Has this been the best part? I don't know, it's most of you. Where are my Bigfoots at? That's my team, apparently. Yes. Good, good. So, so here's the thing. As we start camp, camp sometimes is about decisions, right? You guys just saw me make a bunch of decisions. I have some decisions for you, some easy, some hard. Let's start with ice cream. You go to the store, you're going to buy ice cream. What are you going to get? What brand? There's one brand, right? What is it? Bluebell. Nothing else. You don't need to go to any other section of the ice cream. You're getting bluebell. You can decide what flavor. That might be hard. How about the next one? Let's put it up. Next decision. What are you going to choose? No. There's two options, but one choice, right? Next decision. I know, I know. It's tough. There's also the Longhorns, there's the Aggies, the Sooners, something about Baylor, I don't know. Hey, these decisions are kind of easy. Roll with me here. There's other decisions that are more difficult. Like, for some of you, there's difficult decisions about whether or not you're going to have a cell phone in middle school or what apps you're going to have or maybe even what apps you're not going to have and how you interact with your parents about that. Or maybe whether you're going to date or not date in middle school or who you're going to date. Difficult decisions, and they get more difficult. Some of you had a difficult this time deciding if you were going to come to camp, right? You want to know what friends were coming, and you waited out. You weren't the first person registered. You waited on that decision. There's other decisions that they get more real. I know some of you have even decided, like, not just who your friends are going to be, but which parent you're going to live with. Yeah. Decisions get real sometimes. And when you have to make an important decision, sometimes you can get caught sitting on the fence, right? You know what it's like to be sitting on the fence where you don't really decide, you just kind of choose the middle? You seen that? Yeah, I found this on the internet this week. It's so funny because apparently they had to put a sign up, and I was thinking, like, who would sit on that fence? remembered there's seventh grade boys, right? Where are you at, seventh grade boys? You want to sit there, don't you? You do. Like, you see that sign and you're like, let me give it a try. This would be great. But track with me for a second. We have this phrase sitting on the fence to talk about all the times in life when you don't really want to make a choice, when you'd rather just choose the middle, and you think that by choosing the middle, you'll just delay the decision, and that you're somewhere, but sitting on the fence is really nowhere at all. And this week, the last two weeks, we've been talking about making decisions, real decisions, important decisions, about who is God in your life? What are you going to do with your idols? For Elijah, who we've been studying, his name means what? My God is Yahweh. His name alone is his decision. For Elijah, he was not on the fence. He made a firm decision. And the scripture we're going to look at tonight is 1 Kings chapter 18. And in 1 Kings 18, Elijah has a battle, a showdown. This thing is intense. It's a battle of words. There is swords, there is blood, there is fire, there's explosions. Are you interested? Because I am. And it happens on top of a mountain, okay? We're going to arrive there in, right here in the scripture, Elijah is battling against the king, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 other prophets of Asheriah, and all of Israel has come to watch. And Elijah is the only one. The only one there to represent Yahweh. Can you imagine what that felt like? A little scared, a little intimidating? Maybe you've been in a situation like that, and you know that feeling. Look at how Elijah responds. Verse 21. It says, then Elijah stood in front of them. This is all those people, including the king, 450 prophets, 
400 more. He stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? Wavering is like being stuck in a fence. How much longer will you stay there? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. It's a big time question. It's one that would have hit very, very close to their hearts. Because the people of Israel, they did worship Yahweh. They did go to the temple. They did sing the songs. They did read the scriptures. They did pray the prayers. They worshiped at the right holidays. They did all the right stuff for Yahweh. But then they also worshiped Baal. And for them, Baal was the thing. He made it rain. He was the thing that brought value to their life, so they thought. He was the popular thing. The king had been promoting it. Everywhere they looked around, everyone was doing it. And so they were stuck, sitting on the fence, and as Elijah calls it, wavering. You been there? You looked at idols last night in your book. See, when I think about wavering between an idol, I quickly want to go, oh, that's not me. I don't worship idols. I've never worshiped Baal. I don't do that. But the very first commandment that God gives us in the Ten Commandments is no other gods. No other gods. And he doesn't just give that because it was relevant thousands of years ago. That's relevant to you and I today. It was relevant yesterday, it's relevant today, and it will be relevant tomorrow because we have idols, right? We talked about having stuff as idols. Some of you have an Xbox as your idol, don't you? Like you can't wait to get home because you treasure that time that you get to spend. You don't want your mom to go anywhere after school. You just want to you can play Fortnite, right? Get that dub. Whoa. Hey, there are more idols than just that stuff. You were on the fence. Get another mic. Oh, here, I'll just click this off. We'll use this. Some of you were on the fence about whether you were going to come to camp because you couldn't bring your phone. Because we were going to lay that idol at home. Some of you, it's such a big idol. I know you brought it. You just kept it in your bag. And you're like, I'm not going to tell anybody. Because you treasure it so much. You find value in that. You want to connect with your friends. There's friendship idols. There's popularity idols. There's the idol of sports and being on the right team and the A team and the B team or whatever it is that you want to be on. And some of you are already idolizing being on varsity when you get to high school. You want to be on the varsity cheer squad. Or you want to be first cheer in band. Or it's the grades that you have or the people that you sit with, or always having the right boyfriend or girlfriend. Ooh, yeah, it's real. Here's the thing. We don't call those things idols, do we? We don't. But they're very much idols because idols can be found in where we put our worth. And when we hear this question from Elijah tonight, how long will you waver? You and I need to think about our idols. The stuff that we bring into our relationship with God. Because I have a feeling that we're a little bit more like Israel than we all want to admit. So here's how Elijah handles it. He throws them that question. The people are completely silent because they think silence is going to be their answer. So he says, all right, if you're not going to answer, then let's just have a duel. Let's have a showdown here and figure out whose God it is. We'll build two altars, and then we'll just pray in whichever God, Baal or Yahweh, lights this altar on fire, then for sure that is God, because only God could light the altar on fire. So here's the thing. I'm, I know I'm on the Bigfoot team, but I hear the Nessies are in first place. I need two volunteers from the Nessies from back there. Get up here quickly, right up these stairs, because you're going to just go. Let's go. Two volunteers. Just bring yourself. Yep, there you go. First two. All right, ladies. Oh, ladies first, boys. They were already going. Come on. Come on. Here is, girls, here's your stuff to build your altar. You're going to start with the wood. Stack it up like it's a campfire. Yep, stack it up. You can do it while you're doing it. So they're going to build two altars here. Just just lay it down. You're you're going to end up, we're going to light it on fire. Not literally. Not literally. We're not going to burn the building down, okay? And then you get the wood. The next thing that you put on the altar is is the bull. 
Yes, that's the bull. Also known as Ferdinand. Okay, so let's read in the scriptures. Yes, you're going to need those, but just leave them in there yet. I know, you're like, what are you going to do with those? I told you there was blood. All right, here we go. Let's read in the scriptures what happens. It says, so they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. We did that. Check. Okay. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, what? Confidently, like you're calling on your God. Oh, Bill, answer us? <laughs> that was like a question. That's an exclamation point at the end. So here's the thing. The good news is there was 450 other prophets of Baal and 400 other prophets and the whole nation of Israel there. So why don't y'all all stand up and chant with them what they chanted, Oh, Baal, answer us. Oh, Baal, answer us. <laughs> More. Because they kept going for four hours. Okay, ready? Oh, Baal, answer us. You guys are getting better at this. It says, then there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced and hobbled around the altar they've made. I don't know why they dance. It's kind of weird. Are you going to dance? Yeah, there you go. All right, let's keep going. Verse, next verse. It says, about noontime, Elijah began mocking them. And he said, you'll have to shout louder. You knew that was coming, didn't you? Because y'all's shouts were kind of weak if you were really going to call on a God to bring fire down from heaven. He says, you have to shout louder, he scoffed. For surely he's a God. Perhaps he's daydreaming. Or he's relieving himself, like going to the bathroom. Or maybe he's away on a trip. Or he's asleep and needs to be awakened. So they shouted louder. One more time, as loud as you can. Okay, please don't go home and tell your parents you did that, right? But this is really in the Bible. Then get your, get your swords out. You're going to need those. It says, then following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords. You cut yourselves with knives and swords until blood gushed out to get God's attention. You guys are so convincing. You're the best prophets of Baal I've ever seen. All right. Hey, we all give them a hand. You can go ahead and sit down. You're good. Leave it there. You're good. Here's the thing. I know we made this a little funny. The truth is, it's actually really sad. It is. They're cutting themselves. They're going crazy trying to get their God's attention. And it's not working. You want to know why? Because idols aren't real. They're fake. They're absolutely fake. Look what happens in the scriptures here. It says, they raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no sound. No reply. No response. And some of you felt this before, haven't you? You've pursued your idol, and what did you get in return? Nothing. When you pursue idols, Hillside students, you get nothing. You end up empty. You think, if I just get 30 minutes with it, it'll be great. If I just finally make the team that I want to be on, then I'll feel good inside. But it doesn't work that way. Because idols are fake, they're not real, they never respond, never, ever, ever. It's always a trap. It's always a trap. But here's the thing, there is a God who does respond. There is. You know what his name is? It's Yahweh. And guess who always responds? Yahweh always responds. So Elijah does the same thing the prophets of Baal did. He builds his own altar as well. But then he does something different. There's a drought going on, and he takes jugs of water and pours them over the altar that's supposed to get lit on fire from heaven. And then he does it again and again. This drought has been three and a half years long. That's longer than you're in middle school. This means that, like, crops aren't growing, animals are dying, people are going thirsty, and Elijah is so convinced in this thing, he literally wastes the water. Can you imagine how the other people felt? They're mad. But what Elijah's doing is he's going all in on this thing. It's not just one verse 850 and the nation of Israel who's taking a stand. 
But Elijah is taking a firm stand because God gives his workers the power to stand up for him. The power to take a stand, to make a decision, to not sit in the middle and waver between two sides, but to take a stand. So he pours the water on there and then he steps up to the altar and he prays this prayer. Let's put it on the screen. It says, at the usual time of the offering, the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. It's 58 words. Oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. And prove that I have done all of this at your command. Oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. He's praying for two things. That as God answers him and he sends the fire and burns up the sacrifice, that the people will know that it has to be God and that only God could have done that. And when you see an only God moment, you repent. And you turn back to God. That's what repentance means. It means to turn away from all other things, to turn away from your idols and to go straight towards God. And that's his prayer and that's his hope. And he's fully convinced with the power to stand up for God that God's gonna answer him. And here's how God answers. Immediately, he didn't have to wait There was no silence. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all of the water in the trench. And when the people saw this, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord, He is God. What about us? Have you seen God move this week and show up in an only God way? Some of you might be waiting because it's only the second night and you're waiting for God to move. I'm convinced he's already been at work. He's been at work in the worship. He's been at work as you've been studying the word in your group. He's been at work through your group leaders, through your friends. He might even be at work right now. He was at work when you were circling those idols on there. Because you knew those idols don't answer. And when you see an only God moment, when he moves in your life, there's only two responses. You know that he's God and you turn back to him. It's two responses. So as you come to camp, I think there's two really, really important decisions that you need to think about tonight. Every single one of us in the room need to process this and think this through. Where are we really at? Because some of you, you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never said, you know what, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to say he's the one true God and he is the Lord of my life and I'm all in on this thing. You've never prayed a prayer like that. You've never made that decision. And I'll tell you, it's the most important decision you could ever make in your life. There are some decisions that you can't afford to get wrong in life and that you can't afford to wait for. That's one of them. But tonight can be the night that you do that. Tonight can be the night that you accept him and that eternity for you is absolutely changed. There's others, you've already made that decision. You've made that decision, maybe it was last year, maybe it was years ago, maybe it was a couple months ago. But you've still got idols in your life. And you're a whole lot like this nation of Israel. You know all the right songs to sing, You know the prayers to pray. You know when to show up at church. But when you're not in those moments, there's all these other things that you worship too. Or maybe it's just one thing that you worship. One thing, big or small, that's getting in the way. And it doesn't really matter if it's one or a hundred things. Because with God... He wants to be the only God. That's how Yahweh is. That we need to be a people that, like Elijah, that our God is Yahweh. That he's our God. And I love this question that Elijah asked. When he said, how long will you waver? 
How long will you sit there trying to stand in the middle and hanging on to your other idols, but yet also maybe trying to choose God too? How long will you stand there, Hillside students? How long? Because I can tell you that anything longer than deciding right now is too long. Because I don't want to live a second without Yahweh. I don't want to leave a second without him because idols always let me down. Idols never answer. I've always thought I would find value in those things, but I never, ever have. So tonight, we need to make a decision. We need to decide. We need to stop wavering. Stop sitting on the fence and decide who are we going to be. Some of you, it's accepting him for the first time. Others, it's smashing and destroying the idols in your life. But the choice comes down to you. What will you decide?